Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to AI for Good. My name is Bastian Quast from the ITU, the International Telecommunication Union, and it's my privilege to introduce today's seminar, Seeing the Future, AI-Based Risk Assessment Models, by Regina Bajelet, Professor of AI and Health at the MIT Department of Computer Science. ITU is the United Nations Specialized Agency for Information and Communication Technologies, and is also the organizer of AI for Good, together with 38 UN sister agencies, XPRIZE, ACM, and co-convened with Switzerland. For today's session, we're counting on your active participation to create an engaging discussion. And for this, we will be using the Q&A functionality, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. Additionally, there is also the chat functionality, which you can use to communicate with other participants. Please make sure to send your message to all panelists and attendees, and you can select that just above the message box. With that, it's now time for me to hand it over to our moderator from today, Naomi Lee from The Lancet, who is also a vice chair of the ITU WHO focus group on AI for health. Hi, Naomi, how are you? Hi, Bastian, I'm fine, thank you. It's great to be here with you, and it's really exciting to join the first of what may be a series of webinars on AI for health. So it's my absolute pleasure today to introduce Regina Barzalei. Regina is a distinguished professor in AI and health at the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at MIT. And her research interests are in natural language processing, applications of deep learning to chemistry and oncology, particularly in breast cancer. And Regina has also joined the call for standards to ensure equity and fairness of AI models. She's been the recipient of many awards and prizes, to mention just a few, the NSF Career Award, the MIT Technology Review TR35 Award, Microsoft Faculty Fellowship, and several best papers at the NAACL. She's also received the MacArthur Fellowship, an ACL Fellowship, and the AAAI Fellowship. Her work's been covered in Wired, in Stat News, in the New York Times, the MIT Review, and the Wall Street Journal. And in September 2020, Regina was the first recipient of the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence's new Squirrel AI Award. I'm sure many of you saw the coverage, um, which is an award for the benefit of humanity. It's a $1 million award given to honor individuals whose work in the field has had a transformative impact on society. So we're absolutely honored, Regina, that you could join us today and we're really looking forward to hearing your presentation. Uh, I will moderate some Q&A at the end, uh, so please do send in your questions. Uh, as Bastian said, we're counting on your participation. So really looking forward to learn. Regina, thank you very, very much for joining us and I'll hand over to you. Uh, hey, so first of all, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. And uh, Nomi Bastian, thank you for the introduction. Uh, so let me just see if I can share the slide, which is the first step to success, correct? To make sure that we can do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, share. Uh, can you see my slides? Can somebody unmute himself or herself and say if you can see my slide, yes, we please? Can, uh, we can see a, a black screen at the moment. I don't know if that's the first slide. And the, this, the first slide should say seeing the future AI-based risk assessment model. Do you see that? I, I don't see that. Not yet. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Because it's kind of... Let me just reshare it again. Um, mm -hmm. What do you see now? Still a black screen at the moment. Yes. Do you want to try moving forward and back a slide and see if it's that slide? Um, hmm. So I'm moving the slide. And it's supposedly sharing. Oh, God. If you want to quickly send it to me, then I can share it for you. No, 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 we are not going to go for 90 slides. <laughs> in, um, this is very strange. You cannot see it. Your screen sharing, and supposedly it's screen shared. Let me try something else. I can uh, see the mouse in black, but that's it. Uh, this is very interesting because I don't see what is your problem. So we cannot really, I cannot correct it because I don't see anything. Uh, let me just stop share again and try it. Share screen. 
Can you see something different now? It's still Thank black. You. Yeah. If, if you want, if you can email them to me, then you I... You know what? Let me just connect from another computer. Maybe it will uh, be a charm now. Let me just leave and start again. In the meantime, I'll take a quick moment to introduce uh, one of the work programs at ITU with, together with the World Health Organization, which is the ITU WHO focus group on AI for health. And um, Naomi, who is here now, thank you Naomi for joining, is actually one of the vice chairs of the focus group. And uh, perhaps I'll, I'll leave it to you if you say a few words about what the focus group is and what it aims to achieve. Great, Basti, and I'd be really happy to, especially now we've got an accidental but captive audience waiting for the main event. So, um, uh, Bastian, you said that the focus group on AI for health, it's, um, it was established a couple of years ago, um, and the idea of the focus group is to uh, establish a community around people who are interested in the evaluation, the benchmarking, um, the equity and fairness of AI for health. And it has a number of different work streams, one on regulatory considerations, on clinical evaluation, on data handling, data standards, uh, we have open meetings, open to all to contribute. So, um, anyone who'd like to hear more about the focus group, I'll put a link in the chat, but I can see that we're back. The slides are up. So uh, I'll uh, sign off now. Fantastic. Well done. So can you see it? We can. Okay. This is like the most embarrassing piece when you are a computer scientist and you cannot understand why sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. It's a relief for everyone in health that you also have the same issues for us. So. <laughs> Indeed. So thank you. So I would not, uh, I'm very sorry about this uh, issue. So let me just start talking about, you know, an area where I think AI can really make a big difference on healthcare. And this is predicting the risk of future diseases. And I want to start my presentation with a topic which has nothing to do with AI, but which is extremely contentious in the clinical community. And you can see just some examples of this war um, for instance, related to breast cancer screening. For instance, New England Journal of Medicine published quite a number of papers that really doubt whether the significant effort of, for instance, screening mammography, is it actually helping women or it just increases anxiety and over-screening and extra procedures that nobody needs without really increasing the uh, disease-free survival uh, of the patients. And, uh, you know, breast cancer screening is maybe particularly political topic because there is so much money that is invested in screening, but you can imagine that this is a big question in many areas. Um, the claim is, you know, with the current policy, uh, you cannot really, uh, you, you know, maybe it's not worth doing this screen. Now, I personally, when I read this article, as, uh, you know, I'm just thinking this is really a misguided, misguided question, uh, which has nothing to do in a sense with policy, but it has to do with our ability to predict who actually need the screening, who actually need the follow-up. And it's clear to everybody that it's impossible to create a policy for one size fits all or stratified based on the just one bit family history or age and make it acceptable to a broad population. So to me, this question is not, shall we start screening at 40 or at 50? Should we screen every two years, every five years? The question is, can we identify what is the likely trajectory for this particular patient and then guide our screening or our procedures based on this uh, risk? And you can see that at least in the United States, these issues are really, really heavily regulated. For instance, uh, the previous president of the United States really had a federal law that uh, states that, you know, the patients um, who get mammogram, they have to be notified about the density of their breast and some other health implication. And FDA immediately follows with another law that kind of changes in a mammography and uh, again requests that the providers tell to the patients about their density notifying them about 
uh, breast cancer risk. And we will talk later on about you know, the wrong policy and its application on women, but the point to take here that uh, a lot, a lot of these decisions are made uh, based uh, on the information which is very, very noisy and really not personalized. And yet another thing that I want uh, to say is that the problem here is not only the fact that, you know, women who need care, you know, they may be over screen and so on. Even if we look what today human physicians are doing, it's concerning. So this is an article that actually comes from Europe, from Netherlands from 2018. And what it shows that even if you look at the high risk population, women who have BRCA, who screen with MRI, not even with mammogram, 31% of them, their cancer was visible a year earlier, which was missed by a year, by a year it grew in their body. Again, this is our inability to take the image and to make prediction what's to come to this woman. And there are certain populations which are really particularly disadvantaged because of our policies. And one of these populations, at least in the United States, is African-American women. And I wanted to show you a few statistics which are really frightening. Uh, African-American um, breast cancer patients has 41% more likely to die than white patients. And one of the reasons is, is that not only they get more aggressive cancers, that uh, they have double rate of white women when they're diagnosed before 50, which, you know, in many health plans, women before 50 are not even screened. So we have a very large population that needs to be screened early to predict, you know, their trajectory. They are not, uh, the rules are not written for them. And as a result, they're paying a very heavy price with their life. And when I'm thinking about the risk, you know, uh, in terms of the general landscape of AI in healthcare, the way I'm kind of dividing different buckets is based on what humans can and cannot do. So what we've seen so far, and I'm sure, uh, you know, many in the audience are familiar with automating tasks that human can do. You can, you know, ask a machine to predict whether the patient has pneumonia, whether they have a fracture and so on. So this is kind of... Uh, a task where, you know, machine can definitely help, it can improve the, uh, you know, the cost, the efficacy and so on. But the part where I believe AI can really make a big difference is automating tasks that humans cannot do. And looking at the mammogram or looking at the uh, other measurements and saying what is the likelihood of this patient project in one way or another, it's not something that human radiologists are even trying to do properly. And that's where I would demonstrate it to you today, AI really already makes uh, significant contributions to patients. And again, the idea, the way I want to think about it, uh, even though today I will focus primarily on images and some patient data, but in general, what we want to have is to collect all the information we have about the patients, all different measurements, and then predict the outcomes of interest. So again, we're going from the outcomes, uh, from the uh, input data to the outcomes. And what I want to say is that even if you are using sort of really minimal data, which is the imaging data uh, from the mammograms and some risk factors, you actually can predict very well the trajectory of the woman. So you can identify her one year risk with AUC of 0.84, AUC is area under the curve, one is perfect, uh, 0.5 is random. So you can see you're doing pretty well. And even if you're looking, let's say a two year risk, three year risk, it's still pretty high. You really have a lot of certainty of what's to come. And uh, given that not everybody have high risk, you can start thinking about how do you create the screening that benefits uh, different types of women. And I want to give you a few concrete examples of how this technology is actually clinically implemented already. Um, so um, the system is used in Massachusetts General Hospital for over a year. In fact, when I did my mammogram last year, the system read um, my prognosis. Uh, but uh, it was really put to real use during the COVID time when many women were unable to do screening because of the you know, regulations, like all the non-essential procedures were stopped. And um, 
the clinicians use the model based on past mammogram to identify the high risk women who really had to get screened and they were prioritized. Uh, so this is a type of usages that the model can really show that it benefits patients. And we demonstrated that if you can utilize the prediction of the models, um, you know, model that tells you who is high risk and you send these women to MRI, you can really double early detection of, um, of cancers versus what today's current guidelines do. But what I want, uh, hopefully, you know, I motivated you um, to closer into the, um, you know, into this technology, but uh, I want to spend most of my talk talking about different questions that we may ask ourselves of how this technology is developed and how to utilize it and what kind of consideration and benchmarking we need to do to make it successful. And I just want to say, even though I was introduced as primarily working in breast, I would show a few slides at the end if time allows. We got pretty remarkable results on, early, um, on assessment of risk cancer for lung, uh, for lung cancer. So I wouldn't say that this technology is only <laughs> breast specific, but let's just have a deeper dive on, on a one area to understand the dilemmas. So again, what we want to do, we want to look at the image and predict what is the likelihood of the patient to develop cancer, let's say within three years. And uh, at the time that you're looking at the image, there is no cancer yet, you know, but within three years, there will be cancer at some point. Um, so the question is, uh, can we do it? And uh, I want to say first, how doctors answer this question? And uh, you remember when I started my talk, I show you, uh, you know, this law uh, approved by FDA and our previous president uh, related to breast density. So apparently the US federal law was changed because of this woman, her name was Nancy Capello. And uh, this woman went to do her mammogram. She was cleared within like very short time, like few weeks. She was diagnosed with stage three, you know, uh, breast cancer. And it turns out that unfortunately the, the cancer was missed uh, because she had dense breast. And in, in a second, I will show you what it means pictorially. And she was not aware that women with uh, high density are likely to be, um, you know, can their, their cancer may be missed and that they in higher risk. And this woman put her life really to lobby the regulators and to create the movement behind, you know, making sure that women are aware about their risk based on density. But what is this density? So it governs, governs, you know, all these laws and it also governs, you know, some European laws related to screening. So actually, you know, at least based on my digging, uh, the paper that, you know, introduced this notion to some extent was done by this radiologist Wolf in like 60s. And uh, what this radiologist did, he kind of tried to look at any mammogram of women who were later diagnosed with breast cancer and ask, what distinguishes these women? So he just looked with eyes and even though, you know, he wrote in his paper that he used computer, I'm not sure what it even means, but the point is he looked at this mammogram and tried to identify patterns. And um, he kind of divided, eventually, you know, American culture of radiology and, this, you know, European and counterparts created this kind of buckets of patients um, based on how, um, you know, how much white pretty much do you see on, on the image. And, you know, the whiter it is, the denser it is. And um, you can see the four categories and what, you know, the research claims that, first of all, because you have so much white and the cancer is white, it's hard to diagnose, um, you know, it's harder to diagnose and also it's independent risk factor. So uh, the first thing to do is to say, okay, this is such an important biomarker. There is so much laws written around it. Maybe, um, you know, how well it actually helps to predict better. So the classical model for, for breast cancer as well for other cancers, you know, it's just very simple statistical models, which take into account like age, family history, whatever, different types of questions and they compute risk. And you can see that if you take one of these models and uh, which is again, clinically used in the United States, um, you get a UC of 0 0.6 something, very low. Now, if you add to it, uh, 
density, which is a federally regulated biomarker. You move from 60 to 63. And this is the question, like, why do we bother if it barely moves the needle and it's still quite close to random assessment? And the reason is that, of course, you know, when we are thinking about understanding a human in the loop, what we don't understand that it's extremely subjective biomarker. And this paper from radiology demonstrates that when you gave a set of patients to the radiologists which are trained in this field, some of them find only 6% of women dense, others found 84% dense. So you can clearly see, you know, this kind of biomarker, which is based on our vision and how much white we have, are not really reliable. So the first thing that I did when I started working with this field, I said, you know, maybe we can just Automate it. Maybe the problem is that they don't compute biomarkers correctly. So the first thing we did, which is very simple, is just to train the model to predict density. We use very high quality annotation from expert radiologists. We train the model. Since 2018, this model is clinically deployed at MGH. Every patient gets their density read, which is required by law using this model. You know, the radiologists are very much consistent with model assessment. Here, I don't know if you can see the video, but here it actually shows, you know, radiologists at MGH, uh, they're taking the image, the model reads it, and this is my clinical collaborator, Connie Lehman, you know, the model gives some assessment and then they, you know, push the button and it's done. And again, it was working, you know, it, it's already in fourth year in uh, at work. But, um, and what you can see here, this is kind of old paper, but it's interesting. You can see here, you know, places where there is a disagreement. So on the columns, you see the learning model, how it identifies different group of patients. And um, on the rows, you can see the, the radiologist. And you can see clearly that the machine is much more consistent than the radiologist. But, but even after we put this very nicely computed density, the models still were not doing well. And you can ask yourself why. And the reason is that if you're just looking, uh, take all the women, like we took some number of images from MGH, let's say thousand, I don't remember at this point, but, but let's say, and we asked uh, how many cancers are in dense breasts and how many non-dense. So the difference in rate was six out of thousand and eight out of thousand. It's not such a dramatic difference. But there is 42% of the population that are dense. So currently federal law in the United States mandate you to tell to 42% of women that they have uh, high, uh, that they are in high risk. Of course, you don't feel that you're in high risk if almost half of the population is in the same bucket with you. So this, uh, the reason I was talking to you about it is because there is a lot of thought now that machine need to be computing human identified by a marker. And as this example show, this is really, really a big, big fallacy and misconception. This is a poorly defined biomarker, machines can do better and we shouldn't bring these misconceptions into AI model. But there is something even more disturbing when we look at this model like Terracusic model, which takes on this risk factor statistical models and makes predictions. So here you can see on some data sets that we computed, their performance across different population. They don't work good on anybody. Remember, 0 0.5 is random. Uh, on white women in this set, it was 0 0.64. But what you can see is that on African-American women and in Asian women, they were close to random. So this is really problematic. So as a result, what we've thought is that like, forget about density and all this biomarker, let's just take an image. For some images, we know that uh, their, you know, their trajectory in the next five years, what happened to them here, one, two, three, up to five. And we will make the model to make this type of predictions. And I want to take this opportunity to make an important um, uh, I think an important distinction between the you know, myth and reality. And one myth that uh, unfortunately per perpetuated by many clinicians is that, you know, there is democratization of AI. Um, and this is, uh, you know, citation from one of the head of data science of one of the big hospitals. I mean, you can search for it. It's, uh, I don't want to put his name, but it's, um, you know, his direct quotation. The idea is that, you know, AI is in such a great space that you can just take this AI to any data set, run it and get great results and apply it to your patients.
And I can say that you can really see it in this case of breast cancer, how much it's not true. So one option, if you're like a clinician, let's say you know how to run the planning model, you can just take standard architecture like CrestNet, run it and get the result. Now, if you took a computer science class at MIT, like machine learning class, you would know to do different standard tricks that can help you. For instance, you can do image augmentation, uh, you can play with the, uh, you know, optimization, how you do it, you can do smart uh, initializations, there are also things you can do. So let's say you do them. And then finally, you can do more things, which requires you to be more advanced in machine learning, really to enforce generalization across devices, combine intelligently multiple views, model this progression over time, do real you know, scientific research on how to make these models better. And you can clearly see that the models that are not um, properly, you know, when you just take something from the web and run it, even if it's a good model, it only gives you <laughs> close to random, 0 0.57. And you can see that the smarter is your model, the better your results. So I think that, you know, unfortunately, it's not obviously the clinician's problem. I think it's a problem on the AI end, but I don't think that we are at the point that everybody, you know, just can plug it in uh, and use it. We still can do more and where the accuracy really matters. And then um, again, what I advocated in my talk is that instead of using human biomarkers, instead of defining this density or whatever, you really want to learn from the outcome. You have an image or whatever else you have, and you know the outcome, what happened to these patients in a certain number of years, and you want to predict it. But there are lots of questions that we need to answer. So the basic one, how do you define the outcomes? How can you make sure that this model generalize? How do we interpret these models? And let me start with definition of the outcomes. And this is really a, a tricky question because you know what we did, given the data that we have, we just ask if this patient gets cancer. But you can ask more questions. You can ask how likely that the patient is going to get very aggressive cancer because it's different from just having cancer, maybe slow growth, nothing happens. Or there is a particular type of cancer, which is 85% actually of cancer, they're called hormonal positives. If you are to get this cancer, there is a chemo prevention. There are drugs that you can take that will prevent it. But um, so can you predict that? Not only that the person is going to get cancer, but really a subtype so that you can decide how to treat and so on. And there are a lot of questions that, of course, uh, you want to have a very detailed prediction so that it's clinically significant, but at the same time, you need to have enough data so you can train your model to make these predictions. And um, you also need to, to see how good are your annotations. Can you really extract all this information automatically or can human provide this information? And even though it sounds extremely boring and not exciting, it's actually really important. And we can see one example that I'm sure many of you are familiar with when the thing went really wrong when the annotation was prepared incorrectly and this is a really uh, very so provoking uh, work by a um, professor from Berkeley, Ziad Obermeyer and his team when they identify that the tool uh, that was trained to predict kind of the health status of the patient to identify the patients which are high risk which required triage in the hospital. Um, these patients, um, what they identified that patients with exactly the same, you know, scores, medical scores would be classified differently based on their race. And the reason it happened, of course, it's not like the model was racially biased by design. The reason was that when the model was trained, the annotation of who is sick was based on ICD-9 codes and medical codes based on what procedures do you get. So the assumption is, you know, the sicker you are, the more expensive procedures and more invasive procedures you're gonna get. But the problem is that there are many people who medically deserve a lot of expensive procedures, but because of socioeconomic uh, issues, they didn't get these procedures. So, so the annotation, which was done automatically, assumed that these people just don't need them and they're healthy. And as a result, you know, the socioeconomic bias trickled into the annotation of this machine learning system. And then it was producing this very problematic um, assessments. So how the data is created is really key. And then there is another article that I wanted um, to talk about, to mention that comes from New England uh, Journal um, 
of medicine. And um, uh, actually, surprisingly, one of the causes is um, uh, the mammogram denier that I referenced in my first slide. Um, and they make this idea about cancer overdiagnosis problem. They say that if um, people uh, you know, if people, let's say you look at pathology slide and, and people disagree uh, whether this patient has cancer or doesn't, uh, then if, uh, you know, whoever does this annotation is likely to overdiagnose, the system would learn to overdiagnose. The, this is very correct, that whenever the doctor or whoever does the diagnosis, they bring their own expertise and their own biases in this annotation and the system will take it into account. So that's why, you know, one should be really carefully thinking how to create a notation that the system actually does what you hope it does. Then there is another big important question is how we can ensure that these models can generalize. And this is really important question because remember, we are looking at the questions that humans cannot do. Uh, humans cannot really, besides like giving you density, really tell you what is the likelihood of this patient to develop disease. So you need to make sure that whenever the model, because you cannot validate it, uh, like by, by looking at the input. So you really need to make sure that the model generalizes. And you can, I'm sure that you've seen many of this article, this is one of them from New York Times, about you know, a possibility of AI worsening health disparity. Um, and we can already seen there is so much disparity in the current healthcare systems and <laughs> it's really important that the new technology benefits us all. And uh, I want to remind you that, uh, you know, the assumptions that we are making when we are training and testing is that our training and testing data coming from the same distribution. Uh, so if they do come from the same distribution, we can assume that the performance would hold similar. However, if we are actually moving to a new population, um, which may be a uh, you train it on Massachusetts General Hospital, which is like top research hospital. And now you apply it to rural clinic. Maybe the quality of images is different or something else, or maybe the population is different. And whatever guarantees you had don't hold anymore. Uh, and again, we know this famous example about uh, monkey with monkey, people do it with other animals of what we call nuisance variation. That if you're looking you know, and the monkey itself, you know, deep learning model will predict it's a monkey. But at the moment that you add to it a guitar, a standard model is going to classify it as human because it learned the association between guitar and human. So there are a lot of kind of hidden biases that are in our data that you, we may not be even aware of. And they can be due to change in demographics, to change in clinical setting, to change in the device and so on. And you remember when I showed to you earlier these numbers saying that the standard model used today in clinical practice in the United States is not doing very well on the minorities. There is no um, you know, secret why does it happen? Because it was developed at a time and calibrated on, you know, on white British women. So, um, so if you, your distribution is different, uh, the model is not very predictive. So the good news is, uh, that whenever you are um, actually validating it on, um, uh, whenever you are making your model trained on a diverse population, it actually benefits model greatly. We demonstrated that the model works, our model works very well on African American, Asian, Hispanic population. And at this point, so this slide is not super representative of reality because we expanded since I made this slide. Originally, we started with MGH. Um, in this January, we published a paper in Science Translational Medicine where we tested the model trade on MGH on Karolinska in Sweden and a hospital in Taipei. It sustained the same performance. Then we added Emory University, which has a big African-American population. And you can see that the model that did, um, you know, 77 on um, MGH uh, data set compared to state of the art, which is Terra Q663. It got, you know, very similar performance on Karolinska of 0 0.8 and on uh, Taipei data. And, um, and, and now we're just completing the validation. We expanded it. We did the, use it on data from Brazil, from Israel, um, from more hospital system in the US, which represent you know, diverse racial groups. And we really see it makes a big difference. And I want to say that we really, and I'm happy to talk to this group because 
really need to think about new standards. And uh, I'm showing you the paper that got, I guess, more critique than <laughs> it was a paper of the year in nature in terms of its critique in scientific community. And this is a paper of, uh, um, uh, you know, DeepMind, I think, or Google on international evaluation of an AI system for breast cancer screening. Paper is flawed in many ways, but what is really, um, amazing here that the paper is called international evaluation it only uses us and uk cohorts and it doesn't even provide any breakdown based on race so there is there should be and if there are any editors or funding agency there should be no studies like that because we really don't know how these models generalize there are standards uh, that should be enforced in terms of really providing diverse training and now I want to move to another case. So, you know, in some ways, understanding, you know, how the model performs on different races or different ages or different geographies, it's easy. The non-easy part is when you are trying, when your data bias is unknown. And I remember that when we started working on mammograms very early on, we got this number of 99%, which, you know, it was clear to us that it's wrong. And uh, what we found out that this number of 99%, it took very long time to, to identify the reason, was that the data was given to us by a hospital and they collected all the negative examples from one time space and all of the positive examples from another time space. And in the middle, the machines were changed. So, uh, so what happened is the model was not learning who has cancer and who is not. It was learning, uh, you know, from which time, from which machine the image came. And in this case, it correlated perfectly, you know, with a cancer status. Uh, and again, you can say, you know, this is a really very rare thing. Apparently not. There is, you know, another paper that talks about detection of pneumonia when um, the data came from multiple hospitals. Some hospital has much higher uh, um, ratio of patients with pneumonia, and as a result, um, um, you know, the model was learning from the hospital idea and not from the image. So these things kind of happens. So it's really, really important to make sure that we are very vigilant regarding different types of biases. And I just want even to say that even if you're looking at the machines like Hologic or whatever, which are the same manufacturer, and you look at different calibrated machines, if you look how internally the model represents the image, you can see that there is two types of this uh, uh, Hologic machine, Lorat Selenia and Selenia dimensions, you can see that internally there are two different clouds and you actually need to train the model in a variant way with a um, special training regime to make sure that internally when it processes it, you don't have two clouds because you really don't want to pay attention to the difference in devices. If you want to uh, pay attention to the difference in the tissue of the patient, you need to do something to make sure that this nuisance variation is not impacting your model. And we describe the method in science translational medicine, how to do it. And the final question is how we can actually interpret these models. And there is a lot of mess about, you know, interpretability and it's hard. And the truth should be told that, you know, now there is a lot of work in deep learning of how you can do interpretability. For instance, in this case, uh, let's see if you're predicting cancer, maybe you can identify as rational some section of the document that looks, um, uh, you know, that talks about some particular patient feature. So if it is an image, maybe you can identify a region of the image that, you know, the predictive of a diagnosis, like say cancer or fracture or whatever. However, I'm personally really not a big deliver in interpretability. And I've seen some regulations coming of EU regarding AI and policy, which require interpretability. I personally think it's a wrong direction. Why? Because as we already seen in the case of uh, risk assessment, of cancer risk assessment, we are asking machine to do tasks that we cannot do. Human eye cannot identify what is that in this pattern in the image, which is predictive of future cancer. So even if you're gonna show the heat map, what you know, deep learning was looking at, we still cannot assess it. And we really don't want to dump this model and to make them simpler so that we can understand them. Really what we care about, that they deliver very high accuracy. So to me, it's not about interpretability. It's about making sure that it works across diverse populations. And that's, um, 
Uh, I, and I would shortly tell you what steps we are taking in this direction. But before I move there, I just want to say that, um, um, you know, maybe three years ago, uh, you know, a friend died of lung cancer. She wasn't a smoker. She was um, very fit. Uh, she was 50 something. And this was the first time that I realized that actually lung cancer is a very serious disease. You can see it's a leading cause of death. Um, uh, you can also, um, I would not go through the statistics, they're really uh, terrible, but one thing that to say here that apparently the early diagnosis is really key because today uh, only 20% of the diagnosed cancer are localized, which means the rest are already spreading either in the lymph nodes or in other parts of the body. So therefore the survival of people who are diagnosed early is way higher than for those for whom this is metastasized. So early detection is really the key. And, you know, in this case, we were very lucky. There is a very large corpus uh, from National Lung Cancer Screening Trial and NCI, which is available, you know, for academics. Uh, it has um, multiple screening and follow-up. So it's pretty much the same setup that we had in breast. Um, and instead of teracusic, there is a model which kind of combines very few risk factors and makes prediction of the outcomes. Um, again, this model is not very accurate. And um, I just want to show you that we train the model um, to do the risk assessment up to six years. And here you can see again, uh, AUCs for our model, which is in green and the standard model, which is in blue. And you can see that across all the years, one, two, up to six, this model really does much better than is today the standard of care. And um, uh, you can again look at the, um, you know, prediction even in a short range, um, like within, um, and here the cancers are excluded. We are not doing detection. We're really looking at the future cancer, cancers which are not visible. You can see that where you are with a very reasonable accuracy can predict um, who is gonna develop cancer within three years and act upon it. And uh, I want to kind of conclude uh, the talk by just saying a few words about the organization, which I lead at MIT, it's called Genial Clinic. And this is the epicenter of AI and healthcare at MIT, where people who work on AI and healthcare from different departments kind of get together and do research together. And recently, uh, we were uh, very lucky to be awarded a grant from uh, Welcome Trust on building trustworthy clinical AI. And it have a very ambitious agenda. Uh, I would just put the slide and never tell you uh, at least one of the things which are very relevant. We are, we are currently building a network of hospitals that would enable us and eventually others to validate clinical AI tools. So that let's say you build your tool, you tested it on MGH, and now you believe it's reasonable. So we are creating, you know, both infrastructure-wise and legal framework that the hospital can take this model if they believe it's a good model and, um, you know, find a, a way to safely utilize it and uh, share the data, not about the patients, we're not taking any patient data, really to share the collected feedback. So to understand how this model works across different populations. Um, so that uh, when we did, did that testing of our model, you know, my student had to go to Karolinska with a plane from Boston and with a plane to Taipei to do this kind of testing. So we're building this platform that this large scale testing is actually possible and it becomes, uh, it lowers the barrier for multiple researchers. And um, there are also, you know, kind of foundational questions about how you can integrate human feedback to improve the models. And also we're just now finishing the paper but to Friday about uh, privacy preserving learning. We got very positive results on encrypting the images and uh, learning from encrypted images where you have actually provable guarantees on um, you know, anonymity of the data. So, uh, and again, the goal is that what we are doing now is to spread uh, this technology and um, not only benefit top research hospitals, but make it, you know, accessible worldwide. So thank you.
Thank you so much. I'm sure that everybody, wherever they are, is applauding after that fantastic talk. That was absolutely brilliant. I learned a lot, had a lot of myths busted there, um, and also loads and loads and loads of things to think about. Um, so I've got lots of nice questions coming in on the chat. Um, if there are any others, please do pop them in the chat. Um, I think we have a few minutes to put some of these questions to you, um, and I will do my best to get a good representation of those that are in there. So um, one, of the, one of the key questions that came up early on in the presentation was when you're looking you, at questions that humans can't answer, so you, you made the case really, really well, is it more risky because you don't have a benchmark to beat? Um, and then I guess, how do you mitigate that risk? This is a great question. And I think that, uh, you know, whenever regulatory agencies thinking about, you know, kind of deciding about the, the, what, what is, you know, the accuracy, which you say, the question is, what is the current clinical standard? So, for instance, in breast cancer, the current clinical standard, as we've seen across many populations, not only we, many others published about it, your AUC is 63. This AUC 63 decides who is going to get supplemental screening, who can go on chemo prevention, lots and lots of decisions, no AI, but this is the model that is out there, very poor model. So the question that you need to ask is how much more benefit I can get versus standard, um, you know, of care today. And on top of it, as I was trying to make my case in the talk, really important to test in very diverse population. And when the tools become available, very clearly state where it is tested and where it is not tested. Uh, because this is actually the problem of some of these tools that are these clinical tools like TerraQSIC, that they were developed for white women. They were very open about it, but they were used on different populations. So I think, in AI, we really need to have a way to say where we know these tools are still delivering the benefit. Thank you. That's great. And that does lead us on to the next question, which also came from Rad Siraj. So thank you, Rad, for these questions, which is about how can we de-bias models? Um, so you gave us a couple of examples there, you know, making sure that you're testing your model in a data set similar to that in which it was developed. But, you know, given that we're in this situation, what would you like to see happen now to remove bias and make the outcomes more equitable and fair? So I think the first thing, again, it's really important to train on the data set. This is like the easiest thing that you can achieve is to train on the data set, which is representative of your testing population. Now, sometimes um, you can do extra steps. Like, for instance, you can do within machine learning, uh, the, uh, you know, various, there is like a really a subfield of machine learning about, uh, you know, invariant models where you explicitly controlling and regularize them against different nuisance variation. Like an example, as I said in my talk of doing it for, you know, make machine, uh, making the models invariant to the source of machine, uh, we demonstrated how you can do algorithmically but there are lots of interesting technologies. Unfortunately, I think there is a delay from when these technologies are developed within general machine learning community until they kind of enter the clinical AI. And then the third point is um, really to find, which is not an algorithmic point, but it's an important one, is how you find the best way to do this integration safely. It's true, I don't assume the, the model, you know, you really need to go and say this model needs to explain itself. Maybe it cannot explain itself, but maybe if you are um, looking at the heat map and see that the model, like what our model was doing, which was picking up, you know, the device ID instead of looking at the cancer, this is a sign. So I think the area of research that is currently lacking is how do you put the tool, which is not perfect, but is clearly useful, safely and effectively in clinical practice. Like even if you look at the devices, correct? Like mammograms, uh, people know that for this type of patient with this tissue, they are likely to miss cancer and they have walk around because they understand where is the limitation. Doesn't mean you cannot use it, you can, but there is a limitation. So we need to create this type of integration protocols um, in clinical, um, you know, in clinical centers. Uh, around these tools. And that's why I hope that by putting our tools out in different systems, it would enable clinicians to be, you know, creative in this space and come up with new protocols. 
That's really interesting because I had always thought that it would either be a, a technique, you know, like a there's a, a new machine learning technique or we require more data. But I think what you're saying is, you know, use the models that we have and we will we will start to understand how we can use them in a way which is helpful while we're waiting for these other things to come from other parts of the community. I think that, um, you know, I think it's not one, it's all three of them together. It's, you know, making sure that the data is better and representative, really improving invariance in machine learning and fairness. And more at the end, it's a human who makes a decision. <laughs> Fantastic. Okay, I've got another great question, which has come in here from one of the attendees, which says, do you think it's possible that an AI algorithm can detect very, very subtle malignancies on a medical image that the human expert can't spot? And what would be required in order to detect those images? You know, what, what in that case do you use as your standard? So this is actually a very interesting question about the malignancies. I don't know if there are clinical doctors in the audience, but I have a friend who is a clinical doctor and he has a problem with my research, uh, but with the use of word risk, because he believes that, um, and his name is Dr. Kevin Hughes, he has the Shulka also on my papers, but he kind of believes that what we are discovering is not risk, but we are really discovering very early signs of disease. Like in a sense, if you have a BRCA gene, you can be five years old, you still don't have breast, but you already are at risk, increased risk of breast cancer. Here, the claim is that there already is something happening in the tissue, that that's what machine is discovering. And, and then this is the question of what does it mean, elements? If you hold tissue and if inflame and there are precancerous process, is it the point when it started? Like at which point did exactly it start? But I would tell you, that what we demonstrated that both in the case of breast and in the case in lung, and in lung it's even more pronounced, we can actually localize the region where the cancer is gonna develop. For lung cancer, whenever we're doing right predictions, we can actually say whether it is left or right lung. Um, so, so in some ways it means that you are seeing the areas that something happening. Is it already a malignancy? We wouldn't know because we cannot do biopsy back, but we do see the change. It's, it's so fascinating. We, I feel like we could go down that for a long time. I'm a clinical doctor, but I've spent a long time now working with the engineers and the uh, AI experts, machine learning experts, the data experts. So I'm starting to feel like um, I can question the things that I came into the conversation with originally many years ago. Um, there's a really interesting question that we have here um, uh, from Payal Chandak, which says, what are some of the future directions that you're really excited about in the AI and healthcare space? So, um, actually, I didn't talk about the parts that I'm particularly excited. So there are like immediate things and things which are a bit longer. So one thing that I'm kind of really excited in, particularly in the case of lung cancer, is the ability to uh, cure you know, to cure. And there are, you know, there, there are drug companies who actually do have some possible, you know, drugs or molecules that may be preventative in the same way as, you know, tamoxifen can act as a chemo preventative for breast cancer. So what I hope that, you know, across different set of diseases, you would see that you actually, through these more precise detection methods, not can only tell, you know, this person should be screened differently and we can detect it early, but they actually, you know, in a very targeted way to give them therapy, which will change their outcome and they will not become a cancer patient. So this is one kind of immediate thing. And personally, I really see my work in the next few years, you know, participating in clinical trials and making sure that this, all these AI technologies that we are developing is really changing medical regulations uh, and standards of care. But on the personal end, what I'm interested in, so I do a lot of uh, research on drug discovery and we are modeling AI in chemistry. I don't know, maybe some of you have seen uh, in 2020, we uh, utilized AI to come up with a new antibiotic drug, uh, Halicin, uh, which is uh, which has very good therapeutic property uh, for uh, multiple pathogen identifiers critical for WHO. Um, so I do a lot of work in this area, and uh, now I uh, and it was primarily kind of chemistry, little biology. But now what I see is that we have enough resources and enough you know algorithmic strength. So this we need to build, of course, more. But to take all this data, like 
cancer dependency map, which shows how different compounds interact with different types of cells and different mutations, and put all this data together and create more individualized treatments. And maybe the first step toward this area, you can say, of course, I'm not gonna open pharma company in my MIT lab, but even the first step, if you're thinking how to identify you know, drug cocktails, because many diseases are treated with drug cocktails, and a lot of it is currently based on human intuition, whatever that means. Um, can you, for every patient, to utilize everything you know about them, you know, from sequencing, whatever, liquid biopsy, everything, to find the best cocktail that is gonna work for them, or if something is not gonna work, <laughs> you cannot put them on the treatment they don't need. So this is an area where I believe we can really make a difference. That's fantastic. Thank you. Really exciting. So I think we've got time for just one more question, if you don't mind, if we take it right up to the uh, to the hour um, and ask one more, which has come in via the chat. So um, this is a question about to what extent can we trust AI tools that are developed in high income countries and deployed for use in underserved populations in low income countries? And, and just perhaps when you're answering that, you know, given that this is a, an international audience, you know, what would you call on us, uh, myself as a journal editor, researchers, scientists, um, machine learning experts, people interested in this area, what would you like to see from us uh, before we come back to you again in the next year? Yeah, so, so, so uh, for the first thing to say, I think it is dangerous. You cannot do it. Absolutely. You cannot even take a tool developed at MGH and just blindly apply it, even within the United States, which is a high income country, in a rural setting or in other things, so in different population. I think it is really crucial to test these tools. And it's hard to do achieve it for individual researchers today because you need to have connection. That's why we're very grateful for welcome in building this network and making sure that the tools are tested across the world. Um, and I also think it's really important to make sure that the tools are not fully optimized for high income countries because type of tests like mammogram, there are many countries which don't have mammogram machines. Uh, so there is other technologies that needs to be developed which would really benefit these populations. And it's important to put these questions out and to find a way to securely change, exchange the data so these tools can be developed. But talking about the editors and the funders, I think that we are moving in AI from the age that, oh, I have this model and I get 90% and we cure it, to really requesting a proper clinical validation and testing, testing across different population because unless the publishers and the funders do not enforce these standards, we are gonna be continuing you know, the same pattern. And another important thing is really benchmarking and thinking how, like in the United States today, there is not one corpus of mammograms which is publicly available. This is a travesty because you cannot compare between different techniques. So how to move this field forward and creating the standards that whenever somebody makes a claim, you can stake it against the state of the art and understand what exactly it does. I trust guys, editors, uh, that you would help us to bring it there. So thank you very much. No, thanks to you. It was absolutely fantastic. I know that I have my instructions now and I love the way you use that word travesty and it's right. You know, we should be shocked at the, uh, the lack of evaluation of some of the tools that we're so excited about. So thank you. Thank you so much for a, a wonderful presentation. I'm going to say uh, thanks to all of the attendees. We've got lots of wonderful comments coming back. Uh, thank you to Bastian. I'll hand back to you now. But Professor Regina Basile, thank you for a wonderful, wonderful presentation and a great, uh, uh, great question and answer session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Norman. Thank you all for listening. OK, bye bye. Bye. Thank you, Naomi. And big thanks also to Regina. Um, we're going to launch. We hope you liked the webinar and we're going to launch a quick poll uh, for you to um, for your opinion. And in the meantime, let me uh, mention a few things that may be of interest to you. So tomorrow we have a webinar in the Trustworthy AI series hosted by Wojciech Samek of Fraunhofer HHI uh, at three o'clock, explainable AI and trust like Raguar Montavon. Then next week on Tuesday, we have a, um, an, a webinar. And on Wednesday, we have a webinar uh, on autonomous driving, which is also part of the focus group uh, on autonomous assisted and autonomous driving uh, meeting that is taking place next week. So we will be leaving links in the description that you can use. There's also more information on aiforgood.itu.int. 
Uh, we hope you have enjoyed it and hope to see you all tomorrow. Rewind selector. Rewind selector. Rewind selector.